Good morning, friends. Family, friends, colleagues, welcome to a uh, service that uh, you know, we mix. I imagine some tears with our laughter, remembering one we knew so well and loved so much. Uh, this is very much a, a loss to our church as well as to family and, and, and the community. Uh, Sunday we will celebrate All Saints Sunday and we will remember Helen along with others that we have loved and lost and, and felt with, with great sense of loss and appreciation. I invite you to have both those things, hold those in your heart today. That would be appropriate in remembering this life of Helen. Yeah. I did not know her as well as many of you. I've only been here since July. Um, and she's no mini pastors. I'm pretty sure I wasn't her favorite. <laughs> but she said uh, she had never asked her or whoever in her in her well documented, well prepared. She had everything in place, didn't she, guys? Yeah, yeah. And she said uh, she had names that she wanted. I think I was fifth or sixth down, and or or whoever serving, you know. <laughs> so I said I told uh, Tammy from our staff that I didn't think I was her favorite, and Tammy said, just looked at me and said. Uh, well, you know, Helen was an excellent judge of character. <laughs> Tammy did not say that. <laughs> no, uh, I knew right away how special she was uh, to our church. Uh, we're going to show later uh, a little bit of footage of the last time that, that she spoke uh, in church. Uh, we had a service across, across the way in the park. And prepared for that service, I had asked, uh, I wanted ambassadors of Christ. Who are the best ambassadors of our church in different age levels? And it was unanimous that, that Helen would speak to that. And so you're going to hear something of her last words. And, and I think they're kind of telling about where she was in this place in life. Um, you know, she, she passed unexpectedly and, and in her sleep and the way all of us would want to go. And for us, it seemed unexpected, but looking back, you could give little clues that she was slowing down and life was maybe a little more difficult and she wasn't feeling her bright self. But she was one of those few people that had so much grace in preparing the way. So I feel like uh, this is a day we can feel deeply this loss of this woman we love so much, but we can also rejoice and give thanks and celebrate her life that God gave to us a precious gift. And may we honor that even as, as we miss her in this time we have together to do so. May God guide us and give us strength for the living of this woman. All right, welcome one and all. Elliot has asked, uh, Elliot has asked that we be able to share a word of welcome as well.
when she spent it with you. And she was oh so present. Now I know Helen loved quilting, among many other things. But what she did so beautifully is that when she would walk into a space and see all of these people, she could stitch together a tapestry of community because she wanted everyone to come together and feel the warmth and love that not only she had, but that our Savior, Jesus Christ, had for them. And she shared it so well. Let's pray. Eternal God, you have shared with us the life of Helen. Before she was ours, she's yours. For all that heaven, Helen has given us to make us what we are. For that of her which lives and grows in each of us. And for her life that in your love will never end. God, we give you thanks. And now we offer Helen back into your arms. God, we pray that you comfort us in our loneliness. Strengthen us in our weakness. And give us courage to face the future unafraid, just like she did. God, draw those of us who remain in this life closer to one another. Make us faithful to serve one another. And give us to know that peace and joy, which is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now won't you stand if you're able and join me in singing our next hymn.
and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to melt, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. The word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, and it's uh, my pleasure right now to introduce now a time of reflection and a life remembered in Helen's life and photos. <laughs>
I imagine some things that some of us knew, some of us did not. So.
To which Grandma Conrad, likely speaking through gritted teeth, told the clerk, well, my daughter knows her own mind. In the interest of full disclosure, when the spirit moved her, Mom could be as stubborn as a Surah mule. <laughs> this habit of knowing one's mind, which Mom passed on her three, to her three children, has at times created a little bit of consternation. <laughs> With Don, Judy, and Patty, the loving spouses of, respectively, Tamara, Elliot, and William. The girl who impressed the local librarians with her prodigious reading habits became, in 1946, the first of her family to graduate from high school. Helen then attended the University of Denver and, in 1950, became the first of her family to earn a college degree. In Denver, she met, her first, she met her future husband, Claude Drumright. Helen and Bud moved in 1955 to East Lake, Colorado, where they lived for nearly 35 years, raising their three children. In 1966, she earned her teaching certificate from Regis College and then taught elementary school for nearly 20 years. Amid the joys, sorrows, and the turbulence of marriage and rearing children, she was mom and Aunt Helen. In, in her turn, she became grandma to both Kelly and Jack. As steady as the river, as constant as the seasons. When mom, Aunt Helen, grandma was called on, she was there. From hemming a niece's wedding gown, making pies for the pie parlor at John C. Fremont days, to finishing a quilt for family and friends, to making egg salad to ease the anguish of those enduring bereavement. For 175 Birch Avenue in Eastlake, and 245 West 20th here in Fremont, were not just dwellings, they were home. And in the long and winding roads of her children's respective lives, Home they remain. Mom held the center, and with that, she held all the family together. In their turn, her children gave her the gift of leading independent and productive lives, one that mom could, with justifiable pride, boast about. On a personal note, each spring when I donned my academic regalia for graduation ceremonies, I take comfort in that the spirit of mom is contained in the fabric of the gown. But as the verse explained, to everything there is a season. And as all rivers flow on, and so must we. For Helen, her time has come. Requiem Scott et Pache. So I finished with this scene. It is a Sunday after church and dinner is ready. The sun shines following a brief thunder shower. Work all done, hair is laid by. In this late summer state, the corn stands ripe and tall, ready for harvest. Fields are full, and leaves ripple in the wind for as far as the eye can see. Nellie is joyfully greeted by her parents, her grandparents, and other relatives and friends. They all sit at the table and savor a bountiful dinner. After this Thanksgiving-type feast, the family gathers to play pitch. The new cards, the deck used for guests, is brought out. I can see Mom with a sly smile as she naps the Jack and the Joker, totals 15, and goes out in triumph. And I could hear the jocular comments directed toward the poor soul who sat on 14, but who went sat on a bit of one. <laughs> and that poor soul would definitely have not been her mother. <laughs> great grandpa and great grandma Holtz, grandma and grandpa Conrad, uncles Purse, Mark and Tim, cousin Leroy, such friends as Norman Turner and Leona Kazel. All there, all glad that Nellie is home. 
and despite our sadness, glad too are her children. For mom was there when we each drew our first breath, and her spirit will be present when we each utter our final sigh. Rest in peace, mom. Rest in peace.
and with, I have a few things to tell you about them all, and some things I hope will make you smile. Should I? Okay. Too short. <laughs> okay, some memories of mom. Many of you here today knew mom from the past 30 years that she has lived in Fremont. But there was a whole other life spent in Colorado raising her children. And it is some of those personal recollections I would like to tell you about now. We grew up in a small home in East Lake, Colorado. Our home and dad's shop sat on one acre and was surrounded by 30 more acres. Living in the country meant many of our pets came, came to us being dropped off and usually expecting a litter. And so it was that we learned of the miracle of birth with kittens born in my closet and puppies born in the barn. Inevitably, we learned about death, too, with Mom holding my hand on the long trek to the barn to bury my pet cats. Mom would usually say something meant to be reassuring, such as, God needed another cat in heaven to catch mice. After about the third burial or so, this explanation wore a little thin with me, and I asked her once, well, why can't he take someone else's cat? <laughs> I don't remember Mom's response to that question, but I sure wish she was holding my hand now. Elliot remembers swinging on the legs of the ironing board while Mom was ironing. We walked the mile or so to our school, East Lake Elementary, and Mom was one of the PTA parents planning the carnivals, the cakewalk, the fun house, and other activities. She could be counted upon to bring cupcakes to class on our birthdays. She also sewed some of my favorite Halloween costumes, including my red ballerina tutu and a princess dress. When I was 11, I won a prize for a play I had written entitled The Dragon's Quest. When my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Ladwig, decided that our class would put on a production of the play, it fell to Mom to create a dragon costume for me. I didn't breathe fire, but I was a stylish dragon. Mom began teaching elementary school full-time when I was about 12 and taught for nearly 20 years. She loved teaching and the fact that she would be off summers with us. She enjoyed creating lessons that sparked children's interest in learning, and she instilled in all of us a lifelong love of reading. Mom loved the holidays, too, and it seems a little unfair that she should leave just now. On Halloween, she took us trick-or-treating. Those were the days of big five-cent candy bars, Mrs. Williams' popcorn balls, and Mrs. Robert's fudge. Thanksgiving was Mom's favorite holiday, and she enjoyed cooking the turkey and all the trimmings. But most of all, she had heartfelt gratitude seeing family and extended family and friends around the table each year. Mom planned for Christmas early, saving green stamps, making Barbie doll clothes, fudge, and spritz cookies. Money was always tight, but Christmas morning we woke Mom up early to see what Santa Claus brought, and she watched us discover our new toys. Many of you know what a great cook Mom was. We got to have our favorite foods on our birthdays. Spaghetti and German chocolate cake for me, fried chicken and apple pie for Elliot, and steak and cherry pie for Will. And I can't even imagine how many pounds of egg salad and dozens of cookies Mom has made for celebrations of life and other occasions over the years. I think we are having egg salad sandwiches today in her honor, and I believe the ladies have mom's recipe. So hopefully she is looking down and supervising just once more. <laughs> mom's favorite Christmas cookies were spreets, and since Elliot has been her Christmas baking buddy for many years now, those are also on the menu today. It's not an exaggeration to say that Mom's pie-making skills were legendary, and her crust could melt in your mouth. Some years ago, I tasted a gooseberry pie at the Burlington County Fair in Colorado, and Mom began a quest to make a perfect gooseberry pie. I looked for recipes far and wide on the internet, and Mom advertised in the Tribune for gooseberries in order to have a supply in the freezer. Gooseberries are a little tricky. You have to trim the stems and sweeten them just so, as they are tart. The pie parlor at John C. Fremont days was the recipient of many of these pies, as well as other flavors. And more than once, individuals wanted to pay for a whole pie of moms rather than just a slice. 
In fact, there are still some bags of gooseberries in your freezer. And even though I know how to make the recipe, I know somehow the pie will never taste quite the same again. For the past 30 years, Mom made her home in Fremont. My brothers and I are so grateful for all the friends who looked after her when we couldn't be there. Fremont was a perfect size for Mom with a slower pace of life that suited her well and one that has long since disappeared in much of Colorado. I always knew I could call someone in the middle of the night if I was worried about mom and they would check on her. Sometimes I received those calls of concern, like the time her bank staff called to let me know first that mom was all right, but their fence wasn't, and she had an accident with the car. She had it fixed quietly, but it fell to me a month later when I visited for a birthday to persuade her to, th and to, th to think about stopping driving. Gratefully, she understood. Mom liked her independence. There was a long weekend years ago when I tried to call her several times and couldn't reach her. I think it was Virginia who called around and learned that Mom was on a bus trip. When she finally got home, I called her, and I must admit, that I was a little exasperated, as of course I imagined the worst. I asked her if she might consider calling one of her children and letting us know when she would be awake on these trips. There was a moment of silence on the phone, and then she said, well, honey, now you know how I felt. When you were 17, it was midnight, and you had to come home. <laughs> That's not the answer I was looking for. Yet another time, some years ago, I called to ask if she would be home the weekend of July 25th so I could visit. She wondered why I didn't come earlier for John C. Fremont days, and I said, oh, the 25th was best. I felt pleased with myself that I would be combining a trip to see Mom with another activity which I hadn't yet mentioned. Another moment of silence, and then, Tam, does this have anything to do with the story I read in the World Herald this morning? about Paul McCartney being in concert in Omaha July 25th. <laughs> Confirmation yet again that I wasn't nearly as clever as I thought. Mom kept busy the past 30 years volunteering for so many causes. She was a Red Cross volunteer for 25 years. She crocheted baby blankets and prayer shawls, made quilts of all sizes and kinds, both individually and most often with the quilt ladies right here at the Methodist Church. Probably the most perfect volunteer job she ever had was handling and pricing all those donated books at the annual book sale to benefit the library. Her children and grandchildren, as well as many friends, have all been recipients of books she found while sorting the thousands of books donated each year. Mom kept up on current events, reading the newspaper thoroughly and watching the news on television. She routinely cut out articles and recipes and sent them to us, especially when she was mentioned in a story or got her picture in the paper. She voted in every election, large and small, and genuinely believed that if you failed to exercise your civic duty, you forfeited your right to complain. Mom certainly possessed good mid conservative Midwestern values, and I know I'm standing sometimes in the heart of of Republican country. She had many friends, Democrat and Republican. However, I hope Mom won't mind that I share with all of you now. At heart, she was a Democrat. <laughs> no recollection of memories is complete without mentioning Mom's lifelong love of receiving mail. I think this likely began with her early years on the farm when receiving mail was truly an event. This has been a theme throughout Mom's life, and I've often thought that she has single-handedly kept the post office in business all these years. I was convinced years ago that Mom would love to learn email and how efficient that would be for her. Unfortunately, that was a failed experiment, and I was wrong yet again. I doubt there are too many people sitting here today who haven't received at least one card or letter from I am almost embarrassed to tell you that Mom often wrote to us far more than we ever wrote back. It was only a few years ago that I thought to save her letters. I'm wishing now that I saved them all. The letters were never long, but reflected her thoughts on a myriad of subjects. I will look forward to rereading some this winter when I am missing her. 
Mom came back to Colorado during the first six months of the pandemic and lived with me and my husband Don, as well as with Ellie and Judy, so we could better care for her as we all navigated the unknown impact of COVID-19. In October of last year, Mom was ready to come home. We were fortunate to discover Home Instead and the wonderful caregivers, Judy and Nancy, who helped Mom stay safe and provide care and companionship during this past year as well as the helping hands trying new recipes and completing projects Mom dreamed of. We are more grateful than words can say for the confidence their help gave Mom that she could indeed come home. I've often thought as I've gotten older and lost family and friends, what heaven must be like. I like to think it is where we realize dreams from life that perhaps eluded us as we went about living every day. Since Mom now has a new view, I'm imagining the following. Mom is back on the farm once again, passing the evening playing the card game pitch that Bill spoke about with her mother, grandparents, her Uncle Purse. Mom used to describe Uncle Purse as a wicked card player, so I hope she's winning most of the hands now. Mom has her own library now filled with her favorite books and access to an endless supply more from the big library, library with no late return fee. Mom loved our trip to England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales many years ago. She enjoyed the history of kings and queens, and I know she is sipping tea in the English countryside, perhaps with the queen, comparing notes as only 90-plus-year-old ladies can. And I'm certain now that every Sunday dinner is a Thanksgiving reunion once more with all the family and friends who have gone before her. There is gratitude in my heart for the life she lived, and I know she will set a place one day at her table for each of us. Finally, I want to share one last special memory of Mom. By now, you've probably noticed that there is a book plate tucked into your program, Memorial Program. This book plate has a long and special history connected with Mom. It resided in the kitchen of the house we grew up in until Mom moved to Fremont, and for years it was on her window over the kitchen sink. Mom mentioned this saying many times in her life, and she believed in the power of the words. It was truly Mom's motto, and I think she was pretty successful for her 93 years in achieving this goal. And of course, the book plate says, I shall pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. We have what, heard wonderful stories from so many of you and your connection to Mom that I want to leave you with a last thought. If you are missing her in the weeks to come, think about the message on this book plate and consider a small act of kindness towards someone in need. It needn't be an extravagant gesture. A kind word, a compliment, a card of thanks can sometimes make a person the day. And if you think of Mom at that moment, well, I'm sure that somewhere she will be smiling. Thank you.
Amen. The service today is uh, much as we were able, simply following instructions that she left for us. <laughs> she had this all laid out, and of course, this is a surprise to no one, is it? This was a woman whose house was in order, whose life was in order. Methodists and Presbyterians have this saying, uh, you can never, decency, decently, I think of Helen, I think of her that way, but so much more. And I'm not going to step on a whole lot of things that have already been said, and said so well. This was a scripture that she chose, and I think kind of speaks to the heart of what heaven's like. Uh, obviously, it informed your understanding of it as well, did it not? Yeah. From the Gospel of John, Jesus' words to the disciples as he prepared them for a time that he would no longer be with them in the way that he was. A whole lot of things that they wouldn't quite understand right then, but maybe later on would. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself. And that where I am, you may be also. And who knows the way I am going? To God, to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Helen was a, a great uh, judge of character. I do believe that. When we asked uh, who should speak on behalf of the church who represent ambassadors, we had our special service across the street in the park. Unanimously, her name was lifted up. And not knowing Helen very much, I asked about why that would be a way. Why should Helen be the one? Because she's very much uh, not just matriarch to your family, very much matriarch in our church. She had nurtured so many women in the faith and understanding of what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The thing about her, she took on leadership so willingly, and so humbly, and so confidently. And more than this, uh, what was truly exceptional, I believe, is that her willingness to give things up, to no longer be the one leading when in her mind, she would, she would step back. And more than that, she would help prepare someone else to take on that role. Truly exceptional. She was, she was great. Not the way maybe all the world thinks, in the worldly way, but the way that Jesus defined it. Those among you who would be great must be the servant of all. She was very much a servant's heart. She was humble. Even though she was very wise and she was passionate, but her humility, and she was very well educated, as we know, and, but she never tried to pull that over on anybody or, or make anybody feel less because of it. She was a learner all her life, always growing, always helping others to grow. For those reasons and others, we had her speak. Uh, so we worked, uh, we, we don't have the best recording of this. But uh, we do have, and I think it's important that maybe you hear her words. Uh, if you can hear them, you might have to listen for them. But she says a great deal, not just about that topic for which she was well prepared to speak. You know that, that she got up there and she had thought this through. And she had said it uh, very well. But she, she says a little more than that, too, that maybe you'll hear as well. So we'll try to, we'll try to play this. Listen hard. Okay, guys, go ahead. You know, and uh, one of my favorite quotes, I expect to pass through this world but once. Therefore, any kindness that I can do, let me not defer your neglect it, or I shall not pass this way again. 
condemned. I firmly believe you that we're all put here for a purpose. Each day I'm grateful to be able to get up and do my daily chores. Sometimes it takes me a little longer than they than used to. I also feel that each day, in some way, we should reach out and touch someone. That you find a way for to care for them, whether it's a telephone call, a card, a care package. There are many things we can do. We all have to be remembered and noticed. We are, um, the pandemic has uh, underscored a lot of loneliness and isolation. To hear those words, I shall pass through this world for once. That was on her mind. I think she maybe had some idea that, that her time in this world was not long. And she was once again preparing us the way that, that Jesus did for that time. That, the verses that I read, the, the verses right after that, Jesus lays that out. He's talking about heaven. They didn't always understand that. When he spoke about spiritual things, they often thought he was talking about worldly things. And when he talked about no, sometimes worldly things, they thought he was talking about the kingdom and, and so forth. And, so they didn't know what he was talking about then and where he was going. So it's Thomas, and Thomas gets the bad rap. Now, Thomas, we call him a doubter, but I don't think that was his thing. I don't think Thomas was a doubter. Thomas was with him, Thomas followed him. I think Thomas just needed a reason to believe. I think Thomas was that, that kid in school, and maybe Helen had a few of those. The kid that was not afraid that ask the dumb questions, which of course are never the dumb questions, are they? They're always the brave questions. The ones everybody else is afraid to ask. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus looks at them and at him. I am the way. I am the way. And the truth. Ellen was one of those people who helped us see the way to the way. I know we're all white Protestants, but can I get an amen there? <laughs> we're missing that. We're coming up on All Saints Day. We will remember all those people that we have loved and we have lost. And it comes close to the holidays, and you're right, Tanya. They're going to come these holidays up and you will remember. And then we sat this when we were sent it to place at the table where she might have sat at Christmas. We all have that in our families. But even though there's sadness, might there also be a little bit of gratitude that God gave to you such a special person. And you got to have her for a long time. And we got to have her for a long time, and she went too soon, and we would have liked to have more. But we had her, and she showed us something about God's love. And those lessons that we hold always in our hearts, until the day comes in which you and I will share. And people will remember us, and what will they say, and what will be our legacy, what will they give thanks for? Thanks be to God for Helen's life, her lessons, for what she taught us about love and life, and so much more, for all the lives that she taught. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing our hymn. We're wanting in the hymn of the Republic, 717 in your name. The words will be on the screen.
and uh, I invite you all downstairs. We'll be going gathering for a meal together, less formal time to minister to one another. There are pictures down there that the, the family has put in place. I invite you to take those. Also at our church in this fellowship all over there, there's a little shrine <laughs> that uh, those from the fellowship group have put uh, just little notes about Ellen and the place that she would sit. And of course, we'll be sharing together those world famous sugar cookies and that big salad as well. And it won't be the same. That's right, Tammy. But she did leave us the recipes. Go in peace, my friends. And the God of peace go with you all. And all the saints on our hearts and minds today, we keep them and we honor them with our best lives. In the name of Christ Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Bless you all.